tonight's lecture is um, possibly the densest of the course. So it all gets easier after this, don't worry. Um, next lecture is important because it's on security, uh, but much less technical. This lecture is about trying to look at data and understand what it's telling you. So many of you work with data in the course of your journalism, or you will work with data. And uh, very often, you can look at the data, and it's just obvious. It's like, oh, yeah, well, it's quadrupled since last year, so that's, you know, that's important. But sometimes it's not obvious. And so I'm going to try to teach you how to, first of all, recognize when it's a tricky situation and talk um, a little deeper about what you can do to try to, to evaluate these things. So here's an example. This is a story that Mother Jones did um, uh, just last month. And it's this whole story on research that links lead to crime. And here's the graphs, right? It's, look at this, there's this almost perfect fit between the lead being consumed in gasoline and the crime rate with a 22 year or 23 year lag, which is uh, how old people, you know, it's the average age of, of criminals, right? So that looks pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, and then there's the, uh, there you go, there's a, there's a map of uh, crime rates and there's a map of uh, lead levels there. Which one is which? <coughs> yeah, there you go. Top is lead, bottom is uh, poverty rate, actually, not crime rate. Um, so, is this convincing? Do, you know, is, is crime a cause of lead? Apparently there's international comparisons that have this form as well. Anyone got an opinion? Well, I mean, if there's <laughs> International uh, comparison, international studies that are comparable. Then, you know, I, I don't really want to argue against experts, but for for me personally, I don't take like too much credence in crime figures um, because you never know whether it's because they're catching more criminals or whether it's because there's actually more crime. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always considered cr crime figures. Meaningless. <laughs> yeah, so you're bringing up a data, data provenance issue, which is actually um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I wasn't planning to talk about tonight, uh, purely for time reasons, but data provenance is important. We touched on that in the very first lecture, how do you encode the world in numbers and, you know, crime numbers, somebody walks in and said, you know, I've just been assaulted. And then whoever is on duty at three in the morning who, you know, may or may not have that coffee or just had an argument with their boyfriend or whatever has to decide, you know, is this a real case? Is what they're describing true? Do it, yeah. It's a complicated thing. Um, yeah, so that's one, one reason why we might want to not want to trust this sort of evidence. Uh, what, what's another reason why we might be suspicious of this type of argument? Intuitively, they're totally unrelated. They're, they're yeah. yeah, so we have an idea that um, we can see a statistical link, but uh, we don't know why there would be a relation. In fact, the, the story does make an argument for a relation, which is uh, uh, lead is neurotoxic uh, to children. It hampers development. It's been linked to, there you go, uh, blood level in lead, IQ points. So it does seem to have some effect in terms of actually affecting how um, people turn out in a particular area. So it's a, an excellent observation. We want a model, but um, in this case, they've provided one. So this is a complex case. I, I consider this an edge case. I'm still looking into this myself. Um, they do say somewhere in here that the evidence is overwhelming. I don't think the evidence is overwhelming. I think the evidence is uh, complex and hard to interpret. And what I'm going to try to walk you through in the space of three hours is a hundred years of development and knowledge in the practice of trying to figure out if something is true. There were enormous advances in the 20th century uh, in terms of technique, 
not just scientific technique, but um, I, I had you read that book on intelligence analysis. So that, that's a, a qualitative technique. So we're going to look at both quantitative and qualitative techniques. And all of this stuff is, I mean, I'm really not going to show you anything that's much newer than about 20 years old, but it still hasn't made it into many fields, including journalism. So we're going to whiz right through it. It's going to be a bit dense, um, but hopefully you'll get something out of it or at least know where you should be looking. First thing I want to talk about is what randomness looks like. We're going to try to get an intuitive feeling for chance. This is really important because all of our quantitative tools uh, and many of our qualitative tools for trying to tell if something is true uh, depend on a concept of randomness. Um, by the way, what we're, what we're talking about is called inference. Inference is starting from things you know and trying to extend that to conclude <coughs> new things. So I see that lead and crime match with a 23-year-old, 23-year lag. I know that lead has this mechanism that causes brain damage. I want to jump from those two facts to lead is the cause of this crime wave that America saw in the 90s. And we do this all the time. We're often very interested in, in causes or we're very interested in drawing some conclusions about things we can't directly observe. Okay, which one is random? Or which one is more random? The left one, why? You guys are good. Most people say the, uh, the right one. Uh, in fact, the right one is not random. It's, um, there's randomness in it, but what they've actually done is put this, split the, the square into little, little points and um, uh, put one star in a random position in the box. But, but sorry, but if it's truly random, then how can you say either one is more random than the other? It's, it's either random or it's not. And you can't tell from a result whether something is random. So there's actually more and less randomness. Uh, the, the issue here is that if I know the location of this star, it doesn't tell me anything about any other star. But if I know the location of this star, I know that there's going to be another star within one grid unit away from it. That's the difference. They're not independent. Knowing something about one of them tells me at least a little bit about some of something else. So there is actually more and less randomness. And part of the issue is that <coughs> randomness doesn't look like what you think it looks like normally. Uh, if I give you a set of data, and say it's coin flips, right? This is the classic thing that everybody uses to talk about uh, randomness and chance. And we're going to talk about uh, dice later, you know, rolling dice. Um, and I give you, I say, I've, I've flipped a coin five times. And one of them is heads, heads, tails, heads, tails. And one of them is tails, 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 tails. Which one is more unlikely? What's that? No, they have exactly the same probability. Yeah, the things that have already happened. You can't apply probabilities to things that have already happened. Uh, well, you can apply probability to things that have already happened, and we're going to have to. Because we're going to ask, how likely was it that this thing happened? Uh, that's that's going to be an important part of our, of our strategy for trying to make inferences. But we want to say that five tails in a row is less probable, more, more unusual. But every time I flip the coin, I have exactly 50% of getting heads and 50% getting tails. It doesn't matter what the previous four were. That's because each coin is an independent event. And that's what we mean by random. Again, it's this idea that it, randomness is, is tied to a lot of different ideas. One of them is the idea of predictability. If I have complete unpredictability, that means nothing I knew before helps me know what's going to happen now. Or it's not necessarily a time thing. Nothing I know about this thing tells me about this thing. That means this thing is random with respect to this stuff. <coughs> Here is uh, some data sets. And uh, for each one, I've drawn a, a best fit, a linear regression. 
Uh, any stats package will do this. Excel will do this. Um, it's, the math is not particularly complicated. And it's kind of what you expect, right? You just, you just sort of take a ruler and you draw the line which uh, minimizes the, the errors. Which of these data sets do you think are random? Do some of them look more random than others? <coughs> now you're all like, this is a trick question. <laughs> well, but this is why we're doing this, right? I want to calibrate your intuitions about randomness. Because most people's intuitions are actually way off. Well, you thought, damn you. <laughs> yeah, that's, I knew I shouldn't have been tweeting that at 3 in the morning. All right, so not you. Which ones are random? Anyone want to take a guess? Okay. There's only one that is random among all nine. There are zero to nine that are random. <laughs> How many of them do you think are random? Four of them look pretty random. Which ones? This. Any, um, any others? Yeah. In fact, they're all random. They, I, I generated these just throwing random numbers. Um, what I'm trying to give you a feel for is how often completely random data is going to have a pattern in it. And it's much more often than you think. So if you're a data journalist and you, know, you get some data set and it's this, let's say this is uh, you know, stock price or uh, f you know, fuel price or um, number of uh, college graduates or something, and I give that <coughs> to you. you know, your editor says, go check this out. Do a data story on that. And you look at this. I think a lot of people are going to be very tempted to say, oh, there's a downward trend. Even sometimes with this. I mean, people have, have argued a lot less. That in, in the US context right now, um, there's some stat that's just come out where you know, Chicago now has more gun violence than it had during the Capone era, during the gangster era in the 30s when people had automatic weapons and now handguns are banned. So clearly, gun control leads to more crime. Well, I'm sure it's factually correct. But that's one data point. Uh, this is five, and you still get these patterns. Now, it may be a real pattern, right? This, this we're here, and this here may be a real decline. But you have to have some plausible, uh, first of all, some plausible reason why you would expect to see that, and also some idea of how much randomness there is, right? You have to make the argument not only that what you think is happening is uh, a reasonable thing to be happening, but that the, the variation due to, let's say, measurement error, like the, like the crime reporting thing, or due to factors that have nothing to do with it, uh, because there's so many factors that combine to produce anything we observe in the world. And those effectively are random if we can't account for them. You have to make some argument that the, the, the amount of randomness is small. Just looking at the pattern is not by itself a very strong argument. Now, now, sometimes it is. And we'll get to how to tell. I'm going to actually give you a tool. I'm going to give you a very simple, um, actually not uh, mathematical technique at all, which is a form of visual statistical testing. How about this one? How many of these look random? Yeah, all of them. Do these look more random than the others? OK, why do they look more random? Yeah, so there's, there's a, one of the sort of rules of randomness is that uh, 
when the, the number of samples you have, the, the number of data points gets smaller, uh, it becomes harder to tell. All right, so here, if I had something, you know, if one of them had a really tight line, a really tight correlation, it would really stand out. Here, you know, this is almost a perfect linear regression, but it's not really that different from the rest of them. So the, the more data you have, the uh, easier it is to spot when something is, is due to randomness or due to chance. And this is a very general rule. In fact, there's something called the, the square root rule. It's, you know, if you remember nothing else in sort of basic quantitative statistics, if you expect a number, uh, uh, let's see, what situations does this apply? This, this applies when you're adding up a lot of things together. Um, so as opposed to like taking a measurement where maybe the measurement is very precise and maybe it's not, but if you're adding up a lot of things together, like you know number of students who are graduating or the, the price of a basket of commodities or something where um, each of the items is truly independent of all the others, and say you they add up to a thousand. Very roughly, you take the square root and that gives you uh, a measure of the it's actually the standard deviation is, is about what it is. Um, that, that tells you uh, square root of 1,000 is about 32. So that means you would expect to see 1,000 plus or minus 32 very commonly, upwards of you know, 60 or 70% of the time. And then twice that, you would expect to see that upwards of 95% of the time. Now, it's not a hard and fast rule, but if you're adding up a bunch of things, that gives you a little bit of a sense of how much variance you're going to see if they're independent. It doesn't work in all cases. But it's more than you think. Let's talk about probability. If I give you a number like, uh, you know, the probability of something happening is uh, a fifteenth, what am I trying to say there? What does that mean? How do I interpret that? How do I, how do I explain that to my 10-year-old uh, daughter who's never done any math? An infinite number of trials. An infinite number of trials. My, my <laughs> god, what, that, that's a concept by itself, right? Like, that's this weird abstract concept. Now, simpler. Yeah, so there's one argument, which is how many different outcomes are there, and if I want to look at one of them. There's another way of describing this, though, in terms of you're, you're on to something, but it's but not infinite number of trials. If you repeat it, you've been once. Right, exactly. So if I, it, this is called the frequentist interpretation of probability. It was historically the first one. Uh, if I do it 15 times, I'm probably going to see it once. Probably. Might see it zero times, might see it 10 times. Right, and this is sort of the idea, right? We have, you know, the number of times I see something divided by the number of times I try it. That's the basic interpretation of probability. And there's also this, this symmetry argument. You know, the, the die is the same in every side. Um, so I could just sort of swap the labels on the side and I'd get exactly the same <laughs> results, which means that they must all have the same probability, which is I've written down here, right? And so this is the notation. So what probability is, is this function that takes takes an outcome and gives you a number between 0 and 1, which is a, it's just a normalized count, right? So it's how many times I saw it divided by how many times I tried. And uh, for what we expect in this case, since the die is the same, is, is this is sort of the picture we have imagined. If we, if we roll the die, we sort of get the same number of counts. Uh, for every face. This is what we imagine a, a, a fair die to mean. That's what it, it means that we have uniform probability. And so we have, we've made this little chart, right? Across the bottom is what happened, across, and the vertical is how often it happened. Or if you divide by the number of times you tried, you get a fraction, so that's probability. So probability versus outcome. This is called a distribution. We're gonna, you're gonna see this a lot if you're playing this with data. 
But a distribution is a theoretical thing. You don't have a distribution. A distribution is, is your model, your idea of what's going to happen. If you actually roll the die, you get a little bit of variation. And that's okay. That's, we expect that. What I think most people don't expect is how much variation there is. So um, here's one of these questions. Is this a fair die? You know, if, if you were gambling and you saw three appear seven times in 20 trials, so tw 20 tw trials, right, you, um, you expect the prob that a sixth of the trials will be a three, so 20 over 3 is what? Oh, come on. 6 and 6 and 2 thirds, yeah. All right, so, um, oh, sorry, 20, sorry, 20 over 6 is what I should have asked, which is 3, 3 and a third. Um, yeah. So, so you expect, you know, roughly, you know, three or four, closer to three for each die, but we rolled three separate times. So if you're a gambler and you lost money because of this, you're going to argue that the die is unfair. A non-gambler would say that. A non-gambler would probably even <laughs> say that. A gambler would know that 25 Actually, that's a good point. If you, if you have any Anyone feel... Anyone who plays the casino would know that that's, that's not an indication of whether the assumptions yeah, so, or even, you know, but that, but think about this, right? Like, if we're asking about this in the concept of gambling and dies and all these abstract things. We're like, oh, no, that's no good. And also, I've primed you because I'm trying to convince you that there's more randomness than you think. But if you have an editor who asks you to do a story and they say, you know, which, which hospital has the highest rate of medical accidents? And you say, well, this one. They're really fucking up all the time. There's 20 accidents and they have seven of them. I mean, I don't know. It's not that I wouldn't run that story. It's just that I, well, I mean, let's, let's look at it. Um, I guess I need to make that smaller. There we go. So 20 rolls of the die. That one looks almost normal. That one looks like it's big for two. You can see, you know, about a third of the time, look at that, we got eight and none on that one. That one looks really weird. But about a third of the time, you get something with a seven. Most of the time, you get something with a six, which is about double the number that we would expect. But with small samples, this is what randomness looks like. It's just straight up chance. And remember, our theoretical distribution says it's flat. Everyone thinks, oh, uniform die, we're going to get this. We got little wiggles. But it's not little wiggles, they're big <laughs> wiggles when the sample is small. And if you want to, you can calculate the probability that, you know, at, at least one of them will be a uh, well, one number will appear six times or seven times or eight times or whatever, and it's, it's just higher than you think. And then you can combine this. That was a flat distribution. Um, there's, there's basically only two ways probabilities combine. I kind of wish I had a slide for this. Uh, if I have... If I know that the probability of rolling a one is a sixth, and the probability of rolling a 2 is a 6. Uh, what's the probability that I will roll a 1 or a 2? So say you're playing a game and you win if the die is a 1 or a 2. What's the probability you're going to win? What's that? At Add them up, yes. 2 6. So the adding works because they can't both happen. So if you have two events and they're mutually exclusive, the probability of either one happening is adding them. If I have a game where I have to roll a 1 and then a 2 to win, what is the probability of winning? You multiply, right. So if I have two events and they're independent, meaning that 
this one doesn't affect that one, and I want I want to know if they both happen, I multiply. So and multiply or you add. There's only one more rule in mathematical probability, and that says that all probabilities are between 0 and 1. That's it. That's the complete mathematics of probability. Everything else you can do with statistics comes out of those three rules. It's a number between 0 and 1. If I have two events that uh, are mutually exclusive, the probability of or is adding. If I have two events, they're independent, the probability of both of them is multiplication. There's nothing else. So in this case, I do both. Here's every possible combination of two die, a roll of two dies, right? And every, each possible combination is 1 36 because they're two independent events. And I'm saying, how? what's the likelihood that uh, I'm going to get that, you know, a 6 on this die and a 6 on this die? So each of these little, little domino rectangles is, is 36. And then if I want to ask how many, what's the probability that I get a 9, all I do is I add up all the different ways I can get a 9. So I've actually used both of those rules to build this little chart. And uh, you will, I think some of you may recognize, if you do this with en enough die or, or uh, enough rolls of the die, what you get is, um, well, it's called a binomial distribution. That just means you have two outcomes. Uh, and, or you're adding two numbers. And that's an approximation to this, this normal curve that you see a lot. When you have a combination of a lot of different things that you're adding up, it tends to have this, this Gaussian or normal shape. And we'll, we'll get to that. And if you read textbooks, you know, it gets way into that. But it comes from just these two rules, adding things and multiplying things. Now, this is a theoretical distribution. So now we're going to look at the real one. This is summing up 200 rolls of the die. 200, right? This is not like 10. This is a fairly large number. I don't know. Sometimes it uses bigger buckets for this histogram. I don't know why. So what does real data look like in this case? Someone want to describe sort of what we're seeing here? Yeah, so we're at 200. If I go down to, um, you know, 20, it gets even weirder. The smaller, look at that, you don't have any 8s or 9s in that one. The smaller the sample, the stranger it's going to look. I mean, you don't normally have 200 points when you're trying to look at a single variable. So this stuff's noisy. There, there's a, there, you know, just because you see a pattern doesn't mean that, the, the question is not, do you see a pattern? The question is, is it a rare pattern? That's how you distinguish randomness from something actually rare. And as I said, we're going to give you a tool to do this in a minute. So I'm trying to get only two things across to you in all of these little slides. And this is it. Anyone here seen The Princess Bride? Yeah? OK. Randomness. I do not think that word means what you think it means. All right, most people have a, a really skewed conception of what randomness looks like. It's way, <coughs> randomness has way more pattern in it than you might imagine it does. And two, it varies based on how much data you have. And in fact, you, it varies based on the square root. If you have four times as much data, you can expect half as much variance. So there's diminishing returns, right? Because you know, if I, if I go from 100 to 400, I've halved the amount of variance I'm look, I, I can expect. But if I go from 400 to 800, then I've only, like, I've added another 400, right? But I've only got now square root of 2, which is 1.4-ish uh, times less. So eventually, 
every additional dollar you spend collecting another sample gives you less and less reduction in your uncertainty. So there's a sweet spot, which is why, if you look closely, polls always have around 700 to 1,000 people on them. That's the, that's the number that gives you a variance of about, a margin of error about plus or minus 3%. And it just, you know, you could drive that down to two, but it would be really expensive. Much more than going from six to three. Now we're going to get into some real journalism here and, and uh, some ways to look at this. The case here is you're working on a story about environmental factors in cancer. And your investigation is telling you it seems like there are polluters. There are people who are putting something in the air or the water that's causing cancer. And one of the ways you can tell if that is true is you plot the cancer rates. And what do you expect to see? So in this case, darker means more cancer, right? So this is counties in Texas. What would you expect to see if your theory that localized environmental pollution is causing cancer? What, what sort of pattern are you looking for? What, what are you going to find in your data and say, ah, it's true. What, what's the story here? Not in this data particularly, I'm just asking you in general, what would be evidence that pollution is causing cancer? Well, we would be buying gradients of incidences in cities. Yeah, in, in cities or near the polluters, right? You're looking for a, a, a cluster of high cancer rates near where the contaminants are. Problem is, cancer has a lot of variability, especially because the case numbers are small. In any county, you might only have 10 people who had cancer uh, in the last year, or maybe 10 people who had cancer in the last decade if you're looking at a particular type, right? Say you're looking at you know, lung cancer from breathing and environmental toxins. The numbers are small, so you're going to get a lot of variation there. So here you go. Let's, let's do the lineup again. So. I'm going to tell you that one of these is real data. And the other five are random fakes. Which one is the real one? Anyone want to take a guess? Number three. Number three is correct. And you have just provided evidence that the pattern is not random, that there's something else going on. Uh, in fact, you have provided evidence that uh, the chance of there's something, what you've brought evidence is that the, the chance that a random set of data would look like the real data is uh, a sixth or less. If I had 20 of these, I would have even stronger. If you can pick the correct one out of 20 of them, because if I have more of them, then there's a greater chance that one of the random uh, data sets is going to look like my real data, and I'll make a mistake. So this is closely related to anyone seen uh, in, in scientific papers or research the p level, p smaller than 0 0.05? What does that mean? Right, so yeah, it, it, it's a little weird because it's actually this like you know failed to reject the null hypothesis. But what they're saying is we think there's only a five percent chance or less that uh, random variation is causing the effect that we see. So this isn't as strong. If I had twenty of those and you could pick it out, it would it would be an equivalent level of significance. Let's talk about some other examples of uh, some other problems that we get in randomness. 
Here's the global temperature chart uh, from 1850. The reason there's multiple tra traces is there's different ways of measuring it. And it's nice that they all line up. That's reassuring. Um, OK, so you look at this, and what's the first thing you see? Overall trend. Upward. OK, yes. So this is the prime evidence of global warming, right? Like, there's. The evidence that there's global warming is there's a very simple theoretical model that was actually worked out in the 1930s. It's just energy balance uh, plus observed data that fits that model. And you know it gets arbitrarily complicated from there, but basically this is it. This is what the evidence is. Now, given that we see this upward trend, would you expect to see an upward trend over the next 10 years? So we wait another 10 years and we look at all, let's say we look at, we do it, uh, look at all the data from 2013 to 2023. How, uh, how likely is it do you think that we'll see a general upward trend if we try to fit a line through that decade of data? You know what? I'm going to make this even easier. Let's suppose that this trend will continue, that it's actually happening, and that it's going to keep happening. But there's a lot of variation, right? So I'm asking you, based on what you see in terms of the random variation here, how likely do you think it is that you're going to see uh, an upward trend over the next 10 years of data? Just ballpark. I want a number, I, and I know you. I don't want like six decimal places. It's ridiculous, but I want you to tell me: Is it like certain? Is it never going to happen? Is it like fifty percent? Is it like twenty percent? What's? What do you think? It's more than fifty percent. More than fifty percent. Okay. Anyone else got a guess? So one of the questions you can ask is, in how many 10-year periods in the past was there not a warming trend? A bunch. It's actually quite common. These are all of the, the sort of longest runs of flat or decreasing temperature. So that should tell you something, right? So maybe. Uh, let's say they're all about a decade. We've got one, two, three, four, five of them. We're looking at here a century of data. Uh, so, you know, ballpark, about half the time, we're going to see flat or decreasing temperatures over the decade, even with this very clear long term trend, simply because of the variation. Now, one of, so one of the things this also implies is that if you have the data, you can cherry pick it. Right? If you get to pick which window you're looking at, you can make it go up or down. And this is going to become significant later when we start doing things like, you know, you see these things, you know, uh, all, all <coughs> people within 600 feet of the factory uh, show way more cancer. Well, why 600 feet? What happens if you pick 200 feet or 1,000 feet? If there's random variation and there's a parameter you can pick, you have to ask what happens if you pick a different parameter. Because, because of the variation, there's going to be some parameter that shows you a different result from the majority. This is a, another good one. Um, this one's also due to, uh, to Nate Silver's book, which I, um, is really wonderful. I recommend you read. Um, 1976, there was a prediction of a big uh, flu outbreak in the US. And so there was this massive vaccination program. Uh, then some people died. Uh, I think it was 14 people died soon after receiving the vaccination. Uh, in particular, in one place, it was three people um, in one day. So let's take a look at this. 
Even using the official statistic, it is disconcerting that three elderly people in one clinic in Pittsburgh, all vaccinated at the same hour, should die within a few hours. It could occur by chance. The fact remains that it is extremely improbable. Okay. Is it extremely improbable? Yeah, okay, so that was kind of a given for this class. It's not extremely improbable. Uh, the person who wrote this editorial did not do the math. And it's not that you can always do the math, but when you can do the math, do it. So he grinds through this, and he says odds are about 8 to 1. I don't know. I mean, uh, that's Russian roulette odds. It's not that unlikely. That's uh, that's less than the one in twenty standard for uh, statistical significance. There's an interesting uh, interesting thing going on here, which is uh, what I'm going to call the lottery fallacy, which is the odds of this is how to describe it. The odds of any one person winning the lottery are what? How likely is it that your ticket wins? Yeah, millions against. The odds of someone winning the lottery is what? Yeah, so does someone win every week? Not someone else, but someone. Someone. Right. Well, yeah. What are, what's the probability of someone winning of someone's ticket coming up? Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, you can you can do the math, right? But it, there's, and there's different types of lotteries, but the, the type where everyone picks a number and then they pick the balls out. In practice, you see a winner, you know, every week, every couple of weeks. It's pretty high. It's you know maybe thirty, forty percent, something like that. The, the difference between those two is they're measuring different things. One is measuring this one person winning. The other is measuring any of these people. And we know the probability that each one wins is millions against. What is the probability that any one of them wins? How do we compute that from the individual probabilities? We did this earlier with the two die. What's that? Oh. So if I have a million people and the odds of each one of any one of them winning is one in three million, what are the odds of any of them winning? Uh, it's one in yeah, one in three million times the number of people. You add them up. It's this adding rule again. Because not because only one person wins at a time, you can add them all up. But because there's a huge number of people, that the total odds become very high. And so you've got to watch this in data journalism. If you have this huge data set, and you say, I'm going to look for something unusual, and you go through it and you're like, my god, this one city has the highest rates of uh, lead in the environment, the highest rate of amputees, the highest rate of college graduates and the highest rate of machete sales. My God, brain damaged college graduates are, are buying machetes and hacking off people's legs. The fallacy there is, yes, that particular coincidence happening is very unlikely. No argument. But you weren't looking for that coincidence. You were looking for any coincidence. And that's extremely likely. Some something weird is going to happen somewhere. Here's another one we're going to walk through a little bit. Uh, polls, lots of polls, um, at least in um, countries with elections, and um, but other other types of polls too. Yeah, I know that was snarky. Anyway, um, so here's a poll. This was an actual number that was reported. Uh, it, was, it was in Florida. So the margin of error is a little higher than normal, normally about 3%. Uh, 
But what they did is they took a national poll and then restricted it to just the respondents in Florida. And they said, oh, 49 to 47, 5.5% ahead. Uh, so 5.5% um, margin of error, what does that mean? Yeah, generally it's the 95% confidence interval, plus or minus 5%, which means two standard deviations. But yeah, it's, it's a measure of how often you, you expect the real value to be within 49%, uh, within plus or minus 5.5%, that range. So what would that be? 43 uh, to uh, 54.5, 95% of the time. In fact, sometimes they'll say it. Margin of error is plus or minus 5.5%, 19 times out of 20. 19 times out of 20 is 95% of the time. That's the 95% confidence interval. So based on that, what's your what's your intuition about how likely it is that uh, Romney is not actually ahead? You, you say forty percent. Anyone else? Sorry, can you repeat? Which well, okay. Which side are you asking us? Well, okay. So the the the. the the reported numbers is uh, Romney leading Obama 49%. What is the probability that that lead is actually not true, that that's just statistical error? Because a poll is trying to approximate asking everybody in the state. So, so you're asking us the opposite of what's on the screen? I'm asking you, how likely is it that that is false? Right, so if you could ask every single person, not just the you know 600 or so, who answered for this poll, you would get a true answer. This is an approximation of the true answer. How likely is it that the true answer is actually the other way around or tied? We had one guess. About 50%. 50%? All right, so we're, we're, we're just going to move, move through this then. Um, so this is the numerical kind of stats. This is textbook stuff. And if there's only one statistical calculation you can do as a reporter, it should probably be this one. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking the difference of two values that have the er known errors. Um, basically, because if one of them is ahead one point, the other one is behind another point, they're not independent. So basically, when, when, you, when you're looking at the difference, you have to double the margin of error. There's... Um, the justification of that is here. And it really doesn't make a difference. It's very close. It's because they're almost always complete. Uh, they almost they add up to almost 100. The other way to think of it is um, this is a reasoning that will get you to the same thing. So this is Romney at some value. And ooh, I have two colors. Uh, I can't tell you how long I spent looking at these two colors during the election cycle. Um, this is Obama here, who is quite close. And so if this is you know, the, the one margin of error, and the, this is the other margin of error, and they're the same, how far do these two center? So the centers are the numbers that are actually reported. How far apart do they have to be before their, their regions in which we think the truth lies <coughs> don't overlap? Yeah, exactly. So what I'm looking for is I want to put this one here. Right? And if that one is there, then they're the margin of error on this pole plus the margin of error of that pole. So basically, just add them. That's not quite right, but it's very close if they add up to near 100. If they add up to nearly 100 percent, but that's kind of the intuition. So then I do okay. Now, now I'm getting the actual math right. So I I turn this this difference between them. Um, they were two percent apart. I turn that. I express that as a as a fraction of the. The standard deviation. The margin of error is, is actually two standard deviations out because that's the 95%. So um, basically that just gives me 
It's actually not quite. It's 1.96, but whatever. There's a lot of twos in here. And then what I ask is, this curve, so this is this distribution. This is how much of the time I think uh, I'm going to have the real value be this far away. right? So what this is, this peak at zero, means that most of the time I think that the most common thing that happens is the real value that I'm trying to approximate with my pole is right in the middle. But you know, as I go a few percent away, there's still a pretty good chance that it could be over here. This is the, the distribution of the error in the pole. And uh, if you type this into a little calculator, and I will in fact do it, so I've, I've turned that this, this, um, this 2% over 5.5%, which is um, 5 what the standard deviation of that 11% margin of error is. Um, and then I say, I do a one-sided because I'm, I'm interested only in uh, one of them being strictly ahead. I'm not interested in whether the difference between the two... I, I don't care if Romney is 4% ahead instead of 2% ahead. What, I, what I'm interested in is, is Romney 0 or less percent ahead, so I, I do one-sided. I turn it into this score. I hit Submit, and you saw it on the other page. There you go. That's the answer. 35-ish percent. So you guessed 40, yeah? Yeah, good guess. So I don't expect you to do this calculation, but I expect you to have a, a sense of it. Of sort of, you know, about how often is, you know, if the candidates are half of the margin of error apart, you, you should be thinking, oh, that's a, you know, 30 or 40 percent chance that actually they're the other direction that's reported. And so this pissed me off when I was watching CNN because they had this on slide, and they, you know, their headline was Romney takes lead, and I was like, okay, so, you know, maybe there's a two-thirds chance that Romney is in the lead, um, especially given that the the previous polls have shown the other way around, so um, you kind of want to average the polls over time to get more information, because that averages out some of the error, although it also slows down the reaction. So if he does take the lead, it, you'll take longer to know. But this is what Nate Silver does, actually. This is why poll averaging works. In the um, Toronto sites, is it um, compulsory to report the margin of error? Because I've always noticed that it's reported the margin of error. I don't think it's compulsory. It's certainly uh, standard practice. If, if you see a margin of error or really any sort of estimate, in fact, any sort of estimate, if it doesn't have uh, a quantification of the uncertainty, right? even if it's just low, medium, high, right? I want to see that somebody took the trouble to ask the question, how reliable is this estimate? If somebody says, we think there's going to be 200 plane crashes next year, your question should be, what's the margin of error on that? What is the error distribution? And one of the ways you can answer that question is by looking at the history of uh, the data in the past. And the wider that that variation is, the wider that the future estimate has to be. So here's another way to sort of phrase the, the same thing we've been talking about here. Um, I don't want you ever to make the argument that, well, you must be seeing something real because this is just completely improbable. This can't be coincidence. Really? Quantify it. And I don't, I'm, I'm not even like, sometimes you can do it exactly. It's rare that you can get it exactly, but ballpark it. Figure out some way to, uh, you know, if you were betting money on it, which is often the model for probabilities, how would you ballpark it? Do you expect to win or lose? And by how much? Or how often, rather? You know, how many times out of 100 do you think you're going to win? And you, know, very, you'll, you, you can get better at this. You can teach yourself to calibrate your probabilities, even when you can't uh, calculate them. And the other thing I'm trying to say here is, is this, this lottery fallacy. Right? It's, um, 
you have to decide in advance what you're looking for. Because otherwise, if you let any coincidence or any high statistic <laughs> be a story, then you're always going to find a story. It sounds great, but that's mostly going to be due to random variation. Well, let's, let's move on here. Base rates and conditional probability. Um, who here has heard of either of those terms? All right, so one, good. Uh, so this will be a learning experience. Um, what we're going to get to is, ultimately what we're going to get to is, is Bayes' theorem, which you may have heard of. This is the, the sort of, um, the basis for a, a huge amount of work in statistics and estimation. And it also will help you, if you can think this way, it will help you to think to avoid certain very common errors. So let's jump right in. Here's a question. Uh, I want you to actually read this. And I want you to actually think about the question. I'm asking for which subject is Tom studying? Anyone have a guess? Lawyer. What's that? Lawyer. A lawyer. Okay, another guess? A nutritionist. <laughs> I didn't even know that was taught here. Any other guesses? Like a mathematical type, sure. Anyone else get that impression? <clears throat> You've read the book. <laughs> All right, so you you know what this is, yeah. Uh, so this is the other book that you should read, by the way. So um, this book is on uh, uh, cognitive biases and how people think and come to conclusions, and the other one is on more mathematical prediction stuff. And actually, the pair of them, I'm going to say, are required reading for data journalists. It's the, the, the theoretical underpinnings of what we do. All right, so we're getting lawyer, mathematician. Um, you know, I've done this before. You get a lot of engineer, computer scientist sort of thing. Uh, how are you making? That choice. How are you deciding it? Well, we were assuming that uh, he's, uh, well, he's, he's, he's going for a field that suits his talents and problems. So. Yeah, so you. Yes, yeah, so you sort of. Not right. So yes, I mean yes. There are stereotypes. The design. This is designed to be a stereotype, um, and you sort of. You know, but because it is a stereotype, we can say that that can be interpreted probabilistically. Assuming the stereotype is at all valid, it's not just completely uh, unfair. It it gives us a probabilistic statement. It says. Uh, if you're a mathematician, then there's a high probability that you're like this. Is that a, a fair approximation of the reasoning process? Higher, right? Okay, a higher probability. But there's some there's a probabilistic influence there. Great. So now let me ask you this: If HKU didn't teach mathematics, would you have guessed mathematician? Would that be a reasonable guess? 
Come on, guys. That was a softball. <laughs> Jesus. I swear to God. Um, it should just be a little vat of coffee in the back. So you'll be all like, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> all right. If HKU doesn't teach math, is guessing that he's studying math a reasonable guess? OK. If, if there is only one student out of the 20,000 students at HKU who study math, is guessing mathematics a reasonable guess? If there are 100 students, is guessing mathematics a good guess? It's a better guess. OK. The point I'm making is that the number of students who are studying each thing is important information. Right? That's the thing that's missed. And don't feel bad. Everybody does this. This is a thing called the base rate. When people are asked to estimate probabilities, normally what they think about is they compare uh, how likely, if they, they compare a description of the thing to, God, this is going to get very abstract. Um, no, that's too general. I, I can't phrase it that way. Um, there, there are, in very many situations, neglecting how likely something is in the first place is a real issue. So, you know, I, could, I can make an analogy with uh, taxis. Say there are two taxi companies, you know, the green taxi company and the yellow taxi company. And, man, I have seen six yellow taxis get into horrible accidents, and I've only seen one green taxi. What does that tell you? And now I'm going to ask you to estimate uh, how whether the yellow taxi drivers are better than the green taxi drivers. What do you think? I've seen six yellow taxis get into accidents. I've only seen one green taxi get into an accident. Right. So what's the overall proportion of yellow and green taxis? Because if the yellow taxis are very common and the green taxis are very rare, the green taxis might be way better drivers. Or the, sorry, the yellow taxis might be way better drivers, but if there's 10 times more of them, you're going to see 10 times more accidents. Right, base rate. Missing this is called the base rate fallacy. And the reason I introduced this is because this is the, um, this gets into conditional probability. It's our basis theorem and conditional probability. So here is uh, literally a textbook example. Um, we're gonna we're gonna walk through this in a in a with actual numbers. And first I'm gonna do it with numbers and mathematics, and you're gonna go, ah! and then we're gonna do it with pictures, and you go, ah. Um, maybe I should flip them, actually. Maybe I should do it with pictures first. All right, so here we go. Um, suppose that you know this information. You know how many women out of 1,000 have breast cancer. Uh, and this is for uh, young women, because this is actually a real piece of medical research. You know, is it worth screening women under 50? And um, then you know, how, you know the number of false positives and the number of false negatives for the test. So first of all, uh, and then we want to know, you know, this woman, she gets a mammogram, she's 42, it's positive, how likely is she to have cancer? First of all, what's the base rate here? The first one. Yeah, 14 out of 1,000. So without knowing any other information, we know that. Uh, how likely is it? What do you think the answer to the question is? Just ballpark. How likely is it, do you think, that if she has a positive test, she has cancer? Not you. I know, because you've seen this. I know you've seen this. Everybody's afraid of being wrong. It's, 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 it's a classroom. You're allowed to be wrong here. Nobody gets fired for showing up for this. About 60%. You're not even being marked on this. Um, about 60%. Any other guesses? Does anyone know how to work it out? So here's a hint. 14 in 1,000 is not a lot. So let's draw a picture. Here's a picture. Um, a plus means they actually do have cancer. 
uh, dark gray square means they had a positive test. And look at these rates for a second. If a woman does not have cancer, a mammogram is positive 10% of the time, which is why um, there's all of these dark gray squares. So even though the test is positive 75% of the time when she does have cancer, which is why when you have one of these pluses, it's mostly on a dark gray square, right? So we missed a couple here. We missed these three, right? But we got 7 out of 10, or uh, 11 out of 14 in this case, right? Even though we catch most of the ones that are actually there, because most women don't have cancer, even a very low false positive rate completely swamps the true positive rate. And so we end up with um, false positive, 99, and uh, a true positive, 11. So we're actually much more likely to get a false positive. Make sense? Okay, now we're going to do the math. Uh, first, we're going to introduce some notation. This is the notation of conditional probability. I'm using P or PR, it's the same thing. So if I remember I said before, you know, P of 6, that was the probability that I rolled a 6. So P of cancer is just the probability that the woman has cancer, uh, which <coughs> is, what's the probability of cancer? With no other information? 14 out of 1,000, so 0 0.014. Because remember, probabilities are always normalized to 0, 1. Right. But these are conditional probabilities. That, that slash, the vertical line there, read that as given that, or if I know. So what I've done here is I've taken this. If a woman has cancer, mammogram is positive 75% of the time. Given that she has cancer, the probability that it's positive is 75%. And similarly for uh, the false positives here. But what I want is the reverse. I want to know, does she have cancer given that she's positive? And this is the fundamental insight of conditional probability. This and this are not the same. So let's, let's take a simpler example. Uh, the probability that the pavement is wet, given that it rained, is what? 100%. The probability that it rained, given that the pavement is, is wet, is something else. Not 100%. Because there's other ways that the pavement could have gotten wet. So you can't reverse the conditional probabilities. They're different <coughs> numbers. They're different things. But if you know the base rate, you can. A little bit of math. Um, old math, 1700s. This guy Bayes, we know almost nothing about him except he wrote a treatise on doing this. Uh, insightful, and you can do this with pictures, and we'll do it with pictures in a second. Um, it's, um, well, it's a formula. It tells you how to go from A given B to B given A. Okay? We're just going to we're going to black box this for a second, uh, and just say there it is. There, this, there's actually some nice intuitive versions of this, but we're not going to have time to go through it. So now we're grinding it through. Um, all we've done is we substituted A and B for cancer and positive, and so we work out all of these things. I have to do one little piece of math here, which is to get the overall rate of positives, and what I'm doing is I'm applying exactly what I told you before. Uh, either she has cancer or if she doesn't, so I can add those together. And then if I want to know if she's positive and there's no cancer, um, that's two things happening so I can multiply them. And this is sort of the ways that conditional probability works. If you can sort of imagine, you know if, like, if I have like A divided by B and then I multiply <coughs> by B, it takes the B out? It's sort of the same thing. If I multiply positive given no cancer by just the, the unconditional probability of cancer, I just get probability of positive. And then I get some numbers, and there I go. 0.1091. What does, what does that mean? Right. So 10% of the time, she actually does have cancer. So we're looking for probability of 
um, cancer given positive. So only 10% of the time, or 11 ish, uh, does a positive test actually indicate cancer. Um, wait, what did I do between these two pages? Oh no, sorry, that's, this is not the final answer. This is just the, the fraction of, of positive tests. There you go. But it's about the same thing. So, th sorry, this is, this is setting it up. <coughs> so I want to compute this. I need these three things. These two are given in the original information. This thing I have to do a little bit of math to get. When I have all those numbers, it's one multiplication and one division, and there we go. Over there. Some of you look worried. Of all of the people, yeah. Right, so all of here. So a positive mammogram is this plus. Right, so about 10% chance. Um, and I needed that for the formula, so this is just grinding it through. This is just setting it up, and that's actually doing the calculation. So the, the, the real trick here, and you can study this formula at length, the, the trick is knowing when you need it. It's understanding what a conditional probability is and not getting it the wrong way around. And the other thing that it will tell you is when you have it the wrong way around, that tells you that you need a base rate to get the right answer. Now we're going to do it in pictures. These are all of the possible scenarios. right? So I've got cancer versus no cancer, positive versus negative test result. And this is not completely accurate, but it's about the proportion. So there's way more negative tests than positive tests. There's way more people who don't have cancer than do have cancer. Okay, so far. So now I'm going to express um, these conditional probabilities. Probability of positive given cancer. Well, I know all of the things above this line are the people who have cancer. And all of the things in this little box are the people who ha or have a positive test and have cancer. And so what I want to do is I want to ask, what fraction is this yellow stuff of this pink stuff? And so um, I'm expressing the probabilities. M just means number of. I'm, I'm just I'm doing the straight up probability calculation. Number of cases of the thing I'm trying to, trying to get the probability of divided by the overall number of cases. So far, so good? OK. The other information I'm given is the probability of positive given that I don't have cancer. So now, the, the, the things that I'm, the denominator, the, the <coughs> universe I'm trying to estimate the fraction of is given that I don't have cancer, which is all of the stuff below the, this, this cancer line here. The cancer line. That sounds foreboding. Um, all right, so it's just, I start with everybody who doesn't have cancer. And then I ask, what proportion of those are the ones who also had a positive test? The next picture is going to be the base rate. How do I, I was given that 14 in 1,000. How do I draw the, uh, that base rate of 14 in 1,000 in terms of little you know, yellow and pink boxes here? What's going to be the, the universe of women for 14 in 1,000? What's going to be the pink box? Yeah, so what are those what are those thousand though? So I'm I'm asking so it's the base rate of cancer, so it's the base rate means not conditional, which means out of everybody. Yeah. So it's just everything. Exactly. And then I take just the people that have cancer. Now, I was given this conditional probability, and I was given this conditional probability, and I was given that. What I want is probability of cancer given positive. This is, this is positive given cancer. What's cancer given positive going to look like? What's that set of rectangles? So the thing it depends on is a positive test. So that should tell you that's the, the larger rectangle. It's got to be all positive tests. Yeah. So it's 
that. So that is not the same as that. And crucially, it depends on the overall rate, which is where the base rate comes in. And this is why the probability that the uh, that it rained, given that the, the pavement is wet, is not the same as the probability that the pavement is wet, given that it rained. Because it depends on this other factor, which is how often is the pavement wet in general from anything. How many, which is another way of saying, how many other ways can the pavement get wet? Sorry, why is the wording very in this slide? I thought the seventy-five percent was referring to that. So you had a positive <coughs> test and the seventy-five percent chance that you have cancer. That is exactly the error. Right? That's that normally when I show this to people and I haven't been bombarding them with two hours of examples of guessing wrong, um, they say, well, it must be 75%, right? But look what it says. If a woman has cancer, a mam mammogram is positive 75% of the time. That's not what we're asking. We're asking if a woman has a positive mammogram, what's the probability of cancer? It's we're flipping the direction of the condition. And to do that, we need to know the base rate. So it turns out that this is actually as complicated as it gets. Even for very complicated problems, all you really do is you just sort of chain this together uh, in a way that I'm going to show you shortly. And some of you will go on to do this in very quantitative ways. Uh, but mostly, the reason I'm showing this to you is because I want you to understand the concept of conditional probability and know not to get it backwards, and when you do need to flip it, to know what information you need to flip it around. Yeah, so that's what I just said. When you need it, you can look it up on Wikipedia. They have a nice article on base, on uh, base theorem, but it's, it's, you know, it's one multiplication, it's one division, it won't hurt you. <laughs> Thoughts or questions on that before we move on? Okay, then uh, we're going to go, um, uh, I think it's break time. I've just thrown a bunch of math at you. Now we're going to talk about a much more qualitative aspect of all of this. And this is, uh, this is sort of drawn from that book that I assigned you to read, the, the Psychology of Intelligence Analysis. And it's a different way of looking at the problem. And the, that is the problem of drawing correct inferences. The thing I like about the approach that that book takes, and the thing that makes it unique, is it looks at the cognitive aspects of trying to draw inferences. So not just sort of theoretically, you know, what should we be doing? What is a correct way to draw an inference? But the process of what people actually do when they try to sort through information. Uh, also. You know, quality, statistical tests are nice, but there's this higher level where you have to make uh, much less clear choices about, for example, when is a statistical test appropriate? What, are, what is the story even about? What, are your, what do you think you're even doing? So that's where this method becomes useful. And it's, it's really a generalization of the idea, the fundamental ideas behind science to begin with. There has been, starting since the 1970s, uh, a body of research into, well, it has various <coughs> names, but it's a type of experimental psychology. Okay, so it's experimental. It's not theoretical. This is about trying real things with real people. And when you do this, you can demonstrate that there are certain uh, heuristics and biases. Now, bias is kind of a, a, a you know, it's a bad word, right? You don't want to be biased. Uh, but let's say there are predictable mistakes that people tend to make, or also predictable modes of reasoning. So here are a few of those. Um, when I was asking you that question about, you know, what does Tom study at HKU, um, that, that is a, I was, I was trying to, to bring to mind specific stereotypes. It was particularly designed to do that. Or if I ask you a question about who drives worse, the yellow cabs or the green cabs, if you can remember an accident vividly, 
you're going to say, well, of course the, the other clubs. And to some extent, you all know this as journalists. You know, whenever there is a horrible earthquake, for six months, suddenly earthquake safety is on everybody's mind, and then it's not. Right? So when you ask people to evaluate risk, they don't evaluate risk by looking at base rate. They evaluate risk by looking at, is there one that comes to mind for me immediately? So this type of thing, um, preference for earlier information, this is, this is a framing effect. Uh, as we're trying to understand a large body of information, we need a conceptual structure to hang it off of, to understand how the things relate. If we start going into it with very little knowledge in the beginning, the things we read first give us the, the attachment points for the things we read next. What this means is you can show that if I give someone a stack of paper to read or, or lectures or information, I can change the order in which I present it and get different answers at the end. So that's kind of weird, something to be aware of. Um, also related to memory, right? Uh, this is the same sort of effect. The memory, how well you remember something is related to what it meant to you when you saw it, not what it means later when you need to recall it, which is another ordering uh, effect. And then confirmation bias. This is the big one. This is, <coughs> you have a belief and you go looking for information that agrees with it. This is very human and very comforting. And this is, this is kind of the thing that um, all of this talk about objectivity in journalism, most of it is talking about this kind of idea. You, know? you go in without preconceptions and you try to see what's really happening. So let's break this down a little bit. There's a lot of ways that this happens. Uh, there are um, in the philosophy of science, one of the things that is said is that there is no seeing without theory. There is no understanding anything without preconceptions. Otherwise, everything that you perceive would just be this wash of sensation. You would have no way of sorting it out. But even now, just sitting in here, it's it's. Uh, you know, I, I've seen a chair, so I understand that as chair. I'm not looking at the individual shapes of it. When you say things, I have ideas of what the words mean. It's, it's down to fundamental levels. And so we have beliefs about the world. And so we, we understand, and in fact, not just understand, but perceive the world in terms of those underlying beliefs. And then there's um, a sort of passive aspect to this, which is, you know, again, we're trained as journalists, this is the idea of balance, or it's closely related to the idea of balance, right? Get the other side. Well, translating get the other side, that's sort of a fairness concept, but sort of rotating that a little bit into a concept about truth or accuracy, it's seek out evidence that would disprove the thing that you think is true. It's not enough to have an idea and go and report it and say, oh my god, I was right. You have to have the idea and then go and you got to get creative about ways in which you could be wrong. Because otherwise, you're just, it, it's not so much that you weren't, it's, it's not about being well-intentioned. It's, it's about failure of imagination in many cases. I'm assuming that you're all, you know, fair-minded people. This is a different problem. This is a subtle point. If I want to prove that what I believe is correct, I can type it into Google and I will find a web page that confirms what I believe. That's possible because the volume of information is huge. So as more data is available, and I'm using data in the broadest sense, not just you know numbers you can download from a website, but information that you can collect, people you can talk to, interviews, um, you know, video archives, uh, old news stories, encyclopedias, anything, right? As the volume of information increases, the chance that some of it is going to support any given position increases. And so if you're looking for it, you will find it. 
therefore coming up with a theory and looking for information to confirm it is not sufficient. That's what we're getting at here. This is a very this is actually a very old idea. We're just going to talk about a modern formulation of it. This is the idea behind a control group in statistics, the idea of a controlled experiment. This is the idea of, um, in an earlier tradition, the dialectic in philosophy, right? It's a uh, you know, thesis, uh, antithesis. Um, this is the idea of the, um, oh, what's the name for this? The adversarial legal system, where you've got a defense lawyer and a, uh, a prosecutor, right? And, and of course, you know that there's, uh, there's usually more than two possible positions. But it's the idea that just producing evidence in support of something, listing the evidence in support, and saying, yes, I have evidence, it must be true, or no, I don't have evidence, it must be false, doesn't work. It's not, it's not a valid method. All right, so far so good? We're, a lot of philosophy here. We're going we're gonna to make things a little more grounded in a second. So here we go. Here's the, the you know, one slide version of uh, what uh, Richard Huer, who wrote this book, The Psychology of Intelligence, Intelligence Analysis, suggests that we do. He says, start with a bunch of hypotheses, as many as you can come up with. And in later books, he actually, there's a book called uh, Structured Intelligence Analysis, and, and one of the chapters is on techniques for generating hypotheses, right? So say you're wondering if, um, oh, I don't know, are fewer people going to college because they can't afford it, or university in this country? I should know better. I'm Canadian. But somewhere along the line, I started picking up all these nasty American habits. OK. Are fewer people going to university because of the economic crisis? So that's your hypothesis. So. We, we have observed something. We see the numbers going down. We're trying to explain it. What are other reasons we might see fewer people going to university? Lower number one people. Yeah, so base rate. Beautiful. Just fewer people, right? Look at the demographics. What else? response. Yeah, so it could be a, a supply side instead of a demand side problem. What else? <coughs> Here's an, we talked about one of them extensively earlier. No, not that they have kids. <laughs> That's creative. That is creative. I'm actually, I kind of like that. Um, <laughs> Something in check, I mean, but 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 you know that's that's ridiculous. But may, but broaden it maybe, right? Maybe maybe it is health related. It has happened. The right the lead thing, right? No, there's something else we looked at, not the lead thing. So the question you got to ask is what's the what's the variation in years past? If there's a lot of natural variation. That? Right. So yes. Yeah, so the reversion to the mean argument is, I think, what you're getting at there. You guess? Okay. Yeah, we haven't covered that yet. Reversion to the mean is an interesting thing. So, in fact, I had designed a little game um, that you can play by coin tossing to demonstrate this effect, but we just don't have time. This this lecture, I'm going to turn into a course at some point because uh, this is important stuff and there's a lot of it, and I'm trying to tra cram all of 20th century epistemology into three hours. Um, but if there's random variation and the last year you see a really high value, the next year you're going to see a lower value because there aren't that many higher values and vice versa. Um, and this confuses a lot of people. You get situations where it's, you know, uh, it confuses people about cause. Uh, you know, let's say you're teaching students, and you say, you know, when the students fail a test, I yell at them, and then they do much better on the next test. So you want to assign cause. But the truth is, if there's enough 
variation in how the students do, it actually doesn't matter what you do. They're going to, most of the time, do better on the next test because there's more up than down to go if there's a certain random element to it. So yeah, straight up chance. Always, in fact, that's often the null hypothesis, H, H0 there. Um, no, there's this idea of one hypothesis is the effect I'm seeing isn't real. It's due to coincidence. It's due to randomness. So that's always one of the ultimate hypotheses. Anyway, we come up with a bunch of them. <coughs> and then uh, information that confirms a hypothesis is not that useful. Because, well, why isn't it useful? What's wrong with confirming a hypothesis? Isn't that what we want as journalists? To, to look at the data set and say, oh my god, uh, there it is in the data. Yeah, first of all, you can, you can prove a lot of things. There's another problem here, which is that the same data might be compatible with multiple hypotheses. So if I just go looking for information to confirm the hypotheses, I might find a piece of information that can confirm any of them, <coughs> which is not helpful. Much better is information that either makes one of them false. So, okay, it's definitely not the case that there are fewer people. Good guess, but no, we checked, you're wrong. Sorry. And uh, so you can knock one right out. That's good. Or differential evidence. Yeah, so we see the pavement is wet and uh, it may have rained or someone may have watered the plants. The plants are wet. So that's not proof that that's how the pavement got wet. Because it could also have rained or they could also water the plants and not water the pavement. But it tends to support one more than the other. That's what you're looking for. You're asking which pieces of information change the relative uh, likelihoods of these two hypotheses, or multiple hypotheses. And the reason for this is your goal is to pick one in the end and say this is the one that seems most likely to us. Notice I've switched into the language of probability. Uh, and in fact, we're going we're gonna to talk about our, our quantitative way to do this. One of the interpretations of probability is degree of belief. Which is a little bit different than the number of times I think something's going to happen. But uh, mathematics actually work out exactly the same. I think there's a lot more we can say about that, but um, the reading does a really nice job of getting into this method, so I think we're going to leave it at that. Um, there is a core idea here, which is if you can't imagine it, you're not going to be able to discover that it's true. <coughs> so the initial stages of investigation, it's to get as broad as possible. And probably a lot of them you can knock out, just bang, bang, bang. Okay, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true. But there's got to be always this openness, this sort of brainstorming session. Um, and the other thing that it tells you is, if you're trying to decide what to investigate next, investigate the thing that will tell, give you the most relative information. You want to be able to discriminate between them. Don't go looking for the thing that will confirm the hypothesis. Go looking for the thing that will change your relative degree of belief. That's what you want. Okay, now um, we're going to do this with math. This is the mathiest part of the entire thing. And I'm going to go through this because this is fundamental technique. Uh, I find it unlikely that you will use this, uh, mostly because most situations are not very quantifiable. It's much more likely that you'll have to make judgments about does this evidence support this thing <laughs> But sometimes they are. In very data-rich situations, it's quantifiable. What I'm going to show you is, again, it's the Nate Silva method. It's, you know, if you're in a situation where there's a lot of data and you're trying to understand how to combine it together, 
this is what you do. So we're going to talk about probability. We're going to interpret probability as a degree of belief, or how likely is hypothesis. So I'm going to say, OK, hypothesis 1, it rained. Hypothesis 2, somebody watered the plants and spilled it on the pavements. And I'm going to say, well, well what I want to know is, given that the plants are wet, how likely is it that someone spilled water on the pavement and that's why the pavement is wet. And eventually I'm going to come up with an actual numeric answer. I'm going to say, I think it's 90%. And the other is going to say, great, we're running with that. Um, you know, or, well, I mean, it seems like there's a 30% chance, so we actually think it rained. And so here's the notation. Um, what we are interested in, the fundamental thing we have to do is we need to understand how evidence changes our belief, right? So you start with some, and this is one of the things that comes up. It, it depends how likely it was before, right? This is this base rate idea. If I want to ask, you know, how likely is it that it rained and the pavement is wet? The base rate for that question is what? <coughs> so we did, we did this before. The question is, um, I see that the pavement is wet. I know that every time it rains, the pavement gets wet. So uh, the, the probability of the, um, the evidence given the hypothesis, that is, the pavement is wet given that it rained, is 100. But we want the other one, the probability of the hypothesis given the evidence. How likely is it rained now that we know the pavement is wet? And to do that, there's a there's a base rate involved, and you want to want to. I know this is abstract. Think about what that rate is. How can you depict the speed? Yes, exactly. How how likely is rain to begin with? So we need to have some idea of that to to do any of this sort of calculation, and then. We want to know how likely the evidence would be if the hypothesis was true. So, so if we're asking, you know, did uh, again we're trying to solve the problem? Did it rain? Uh, if the hypothesis is true, if it did rain, we know that the pavement's definitely wet. So that's 100 percent. And then the other thing we need to know is um, how common is the evidence at all? Uh, and we'll, we'll see why that is in, in a second. We'll actually work through much less abstract examples of this. OK, now you're terrified. Yeah, OK. I wore this shirt just for you. All right, take a breath. This is Bayes' theorem again. If you actually go back and compare it to those slides, um, you will see it is exactly the same. And so, uh, last time I said A and B, now I'm just saying evidence and hypotheses. So evidence, remember, evidence is what we can see. Hypothesis is what we're trying to infer. Right? So we're trying to go from what we know to what we think is happening. And this tells you how to do it. It tells you, so there's, there's these things. Prior, how likely is raining to begin with? That's important. Um, this thing, is, is, we're going to use the word model. We're going to talk about models in a second. Model V, how, often, how commonly do we see the evidence? If we see this evidence all the time, then it doesn't tell us a lot. This is, the, this is this confirmation bias thing, right? So evidence which is rare tells us more than evidence which is common. So that's why we divide it out. Because when, when probability of E gets high, that probably the hypothesis goes low. And then we have a, a description of a hypothesis. This is a mathematical description of a hypothesis. And what that is is how often, what's the probability of seeing the evidence if the hypothesis is true? So for raining and pavement, it's 100%, but not so for everything. So for example, uh, if it's possible to have a cold without coughing, maybe I'm just you know, sort of sniffling or stuffy or something then 
the probability of seeing coughing if I have a cold is not 100%. So a lot of things in medicine work this way. Uh, a lot of things in, in journalism work this way. You know, If there's insider trading, they might be making absurd profits, but it's not a sure thing. Right, so yeah, let's talk about insider trading. Let's say the hypothesis is insider trading and the evidence is absurd profits. What's probability of H? Give me an interpretation of that. Uh, no, uh, uh, profits are the evidence. They're the things we can see. The thing we can't see is whether it's insider trading. So how frequently insider trading is based on the Right. So how many cases of insider trading have there been out of all of the companies over the past 10 years. That's one way to get a number for that. So now probability of evidence. And remember, evidence is unusually high profits. So we can get a number for that, too. That's just how often do we see someone making that much money? Uh, you know, How often do we see a 25% return for an individual investor? Probability of evidence given hypothesis. That's the trickier one. That's how often are we going to see uh, an exceptional return if there is insider trading, which is less than 100%. Maybe they suck at it. Maybe they're just doing it a little bit. Okay? So given all of, that, all of that information, now we can get to here. This is probability of a hypothesis given evidence, or someone want to translate that into our insider trading example? Yeah, exactly. So given what I can see, the evidence, what's the likelihood of my hypothesis, which I can't see? So given that I'm seeing a lot of profit, you know, abnormally high levels, how likely is it that insider trading is going on? Okay, so far? So there's a lot of, you got to make a lot of guesses here. This, this, is, this only works... Uh, if your models are good, if you can actually estimate these values with any reliability. But even if you can't get precise numbers, simply working through this type of process can save you a lot of trouble. right? Because you know, is probability of obscene profits given insider trading, is that 10% or is that 100%? That tells you something about how strong your evidence is. Let's do this. Alice is coughing. Does she have a cold? Hypothesis, Alice has a cold. Uh, that's the thing we can't tell because um, we're not following her around or we haven't asked her. Evidence, we just saw her cough. That's the thing we can tell. So what, uh, what pieces of information do we need for this if we're going to use this formula? <coughs> Exactly. <laughs> you, you need a probability of someone coughing. Okay. So wait, the one, one, one at a time. Someone other than Tony. I know, I know Tony's on to this. Um, all right. So probability of someone coughing. What is the, what symbol is that? Probability of. What's coughing here? E. 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 Right, okay. So uh, let's let's say let's do this for a given day. What is the probability of somebody coughing on any given day? Who wants to ballpark it? How often do you see any particular person cough in the course of a day? There's 15 people in this room and Jackie just coughed. Okay. Uh, so someone other than Tony, give me a numeric <laughs> give me a numeric answer to for this. Give, give me a guess. 5%. Great. All right. We need some other things. P of H. That is what? What's that? Have probability of having a cold at all. So in any given day, what's the probability that your friend has a cold? 
less than 1%. I, everyone else okay with that estimate? All right, we'll go with 1%. And then the last thing we need is what? P of someone, someone call it out. <coughs> Probability of having a cough, have, given that you have a cold. So if you have a cold, how likely are you to cough? Ballpark. 50, 80, I heard 50, 80, 70. <laughs> no, I mean, th and this matters, right? Because if you have different underlying assumptions, you get different answers. And this reflects this. All that this formula, it's not magic. All that this formula can do is tell you how to combine what you already believe in a consistent way. So I'm going to go with the 0.7. So let's uh, let's grind through this. So it is um, p of h given e is p of e given h, which is 0 0.7 times uh, <coughs> p of h, which is 0 0.01 over p of e 0 0.05. Someone got it? 14%? 14%. Oh, so here's what I, would, I was using for my estimates. Uh, I said P of H was higher. I said 5% of the cold. I said that most people with colds cough. So you had 0 0.7, we had 0 0.9. And then I said, that actually, coughing is much more common. So you thought um, having a cold was less common. But I thought that having a cold is much more common. So what's that? Yeah, exactly. So let's see how it stacks up. I get a much higher chance. That's because you believed that having a cold is much less common to start with. In fact, five times less common. Because you said 001, I said 005. But my estimate is not five times higher because I also said that, um, first of all, that having, uh, you, you're much more likely to cough if you had a cold. This is 0.7, I said 0.9. And second of all, that Uh, you said 10 yeah, I said 10% of everyone coughs. You said 5%, which which uh, which is that uh, division. So you're, I'm dividing by a, a smaller number. Okay. Yeah, the answer is going to depend on your estimates. You have to Yeah, in most situations, this is a sanity check. But in many cases, you have uh, you you have real numbers. You have historical numbers, and what you can use this formula for is to check. It's it's to check your instinct. You know, am I way off? Have I accounted for the base rate correctly? Right, it's range. And in fact, if you have if you have margin of error on these figures, you can compute a margin of error on the result too. So this is not again. This is not magic. But it is, uh, it's mathematically consistent. And not only that, it's, it's consistent. I mean, I can, you know, I can show you why this formula has to be true with a bag of apples, right? Like, this is, this is basically a counting argument. This is exactly what we did with women and cancer earlier. But this point of you can be way off, this is an interpretation of what statistics is. There's some things in the real world that we can see. We call them data. There's some things in that we want. We call them conclusions. Alice has a cold. There was insider trading. Lead causes crime. Uh, this hospital has an unusually high number of accidents. Whatever, right? 
for looking to get to conclusions. That's the goal of inference. It's to go from the data to the conclusions. To do that, we employ some tools that aren't, strictly speaking, real. We, we have this thing called models. Uh, and a model is an idea about how the world works. And in the simplest case, a model is just, you know, this, these conditional probabilities, P of E given H. Most people have caught with Cold's cough. That is a prior belief about how the world works. Uh, and we also have, I mean, this is a model too. We're talking about combining evidence in a certain way. And you can get arbitrarily complicated. Your models get very sophisticated. I just did this story on gun violence and trying to look at, uh, you know, reviewing the work on trying to analyze whether uh, certain types of gun control laws increase or decrease crime. Very complicated models because you, it's not a, it's not a natural experiment. You've got to compare across states, but then each state has different factors that are also happening, and then there's also an overall decrease in crime. But you combine all of these things, and uh, you get a conclusion. So it depends not just on your data, but on your models. But you can ask, uh, how much does my result depend on my model? How much does it depend on how I think this works? How much, uh, and you know, how, how sensitive is it? It's this concept of robustness earlier that we were talking about with, with visualizations and text analysis and all of this stuff. It's a basic question you need to ask in all of the work you do, is how certain am I? And in many situations you can quantify it, even when you can't quantify it, by changing a few things and seeing if your answer changes, you can get a sense of whether the conclusion is firm or not. Okay? I know it's a bit abstract here. So, with armed with uh, uh, Bayes' rule again, we can do the method of computing hypotheses in quantitative form. And again, it's unlikely that you're going to apply this, but um, sometimes you can, as, as Nate Silver did. And this is this is the basis for uh, a great many techniques. If you understand this building block, you can build a lot of things ultimately. Uh, for example, this is how you build language processing systems. Uh, I, I don't think many of you were at this talk I gave yesterday. I showed a thing called Truth Teller, which matches, it does machine transcription of speeches to a database of checked facts, and when the politician lies, it brings up a thing that said, they said this, it's false. It's really an amazing thing, and part of what it has to do is compare language that the politician says to a database of facts. And so, uh, every word in that sentence is a certain type of evidence that they're talking about a particular topic, and you have to combine all of those pieces of evidence to choose between which topic you think they're talking about. And that's actually strictly done according to this type of method internally. Anyway, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty much a straightforward translation of the human process, except this time what we do is we literally have a probability assigned to each hypothesis. And as the evidence comes in, we use our models, which is this stuff. Right? This is our model. This is what we think we know already. Uh, to update the probability of each hypothesis. And what we end up with is a probability for each hypothesis. Then what do we do? So we're not, that doesn't tell us which one is true, that tells us how likely each one is given the evidence that we've seen so far. But suppose we've seen all of the evidence. What, how do we draw a conclusion from this list of probabilities of different hypotheses? No one want to hazard a guess? So I've run all this stuff, and the probability that it's wet because someone watered the plants is 30%, and the probability that it's wet because it rained is 70%. Have I learned anything? What's that? Yeah. 
Yeah, maybe, right? So, I mean, there's a bunch of different things you can do. You can take the hypothesis with the highest probability and say, that's my answer. Or you could say, like, like, uh, like Watson did, if nothing goes above a certain threshold, you can say, I don't know. You can also get ties, right? So if you have something on the left um, where they're all about the same, you don't really know. If you have something on the right, then maybe you say, ah, we're going to conclude H2, that's our lead. The other thing you could say is that they're all equally likely. I mean, that's the story too, you know. Or they all contributed, you know. Uh, fewer people are going to university because there are fewer people, because they can't afford it, and because there are fewer places. That could be the answer as well. But um, back when we started this uh, process, mm -hmm. were you just saying we wanted to knock out some of the hypotheses? If we can. <laughs> How would we do that with just a bunch of probability? Aha. So if a, a, a knocking out a hypothesis means that the probability goes to zero, or nearly so. So what that would mean in terms of this formula is that we get a piece of evidence uh, which is we would never see given this hypothesis, right? So let's take the hypothesis um, I'm blanking on this one. Maybe it's, uh, it's what, I, what, I, um, what I'm getting at is, do we only eliminate ones that have zero percent, or do we set something threshold and say it's lower than this? And this oh, okay. Um, well, it's kind of like the the ninety five percent confidence interval in scientific publishing, right? There's nothing magic about ninety five percent. In fact, there's a whole shelf full of results that had ninety four percent confidence. You know, it's just an arbitrary line. There's a whole, you know, it, it, it's a sort of judgment call. There's, a, there's almost a philosophical debate. You know, should we publish results that are accurate to p smaller than 0.5, or should it be 0.1, or should it be 0 0.01? Uh, and of course, your estimates of probability are going to have error in them because they're going to be sensitive to your data and your models. You know, it, it's just because this is a number, and when you type it in you get it out to three decimal places, doesn't make it three decimal places of precision. So like most things in journalism, it in the end it comes down to a judgment call. There is no there is no substitute for that. But I can tell you that what happens is this, if your model says that if this hypothesis is true, then you should never see that piece of evidence and you do see that piece of evidence, then this term is zero, and which means that your hypothesis goes to zero. That means no additional evidence will ever make that go very high again. So we got as far as this. We now have different hypotheses. We have different amounts of evidence for each one. Uh, and then we have to pick one, or we have to say that we can't pick one, or we have to say that uh, they all contribute, or there's different ways of interpreting this. There's always this interpretive step when you go from the mechanical world to the human world. Okay, one last thing, correlation and causation. Very often what we're asked to conclude is whether or not one thing causes another thing. So. Uh, Here's some examples of correlation and causation. Did Ava's cause the housing bubble? Well, Ava's peaked and housing peaked. Anyway, you, you can see the, uh, these are great. And, and there's even more. I, I'm going to show you something called Google Correlate. I think I should, no, I showed you uh, n-grams, not correlate. So what this does is it searches for terms that correlate with a particular search term. So if I type in one word, it will show me a, a history of how often people search for that and show me all the other words that follow that same pattern. And we'll do it over time with space, actually. So uh, let's have a search term. 
So the, the reason this is interesting, backing up slightly, is they discovered that people searching for words like flu and sickness and, you know, how do I relieve a headache, uh, were actually very good indications on the current infection rate for influenza. They discovered this by comparing the CDC data, but the search data was more complete. Uh, it was higher resolution in time and space, covered things that the official data did not, and was also faster because it was instant. You knew that hour how many people had the flu. And so they thought, well, maybe we can see other patterns. Maybe we can tell uh, when people are enrolling to university by looking for, you know, GRE tutor or you know all these kinds of things. So give me a, give me a word that uh, might have some interesting implications if people are searching for it. Word or phrase? Fresh. 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 Car you want to say car crash to differentiate it from? Uh, and what do you think we're going to find out if we look at this? Okay, well, car crash, car wreck today, that makes sense. So there it is, with certain spikes, interesting spikes. I wonder why we'd have to look at the news or something to try to figure out what these spikes are. Old ember. I am a mountain, I am a tall tree. Oh, that fat tattoo. Wow, that's a good one. Um, Sorry. Those, that short there, those terms, mm -hmm. that's what people are finding. Yes. And how is it correlating with that stuff? Just, just looks at the graphs, right? So if I pick, I am a mountain, I am a tree. Um, there you go. Car crashes in blue. I am a mountain, I'm a tall tree. They correlate. That's a correlation. So that one is kind of silly, but let's try this one. I don't think we actually got anything that made sense. But this one... Oh, so we're saying color like that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so first of all, summer has this seasonal pattern. What a shock. People are talking about summer and summer. And actually, less afterwards and more before, there's this anticipation. But look, swimming lessons, kids camp, summer baseball. Uh, let's do that. Beach bag, sandals. That makes sense. Chicken marinade, <laughs> razor burn. I don't. I don't know how um, a, a swelling goes with ice cream. Or maybe you're supposed to like eat, put ice cream on the swelling part. Or... <laughs> so you can see some of these. But razor burn. I mean, you know, you can see some of these correlate and some of these don't. So why would I have? But let's look at this for a second, right? So again, I get this this seasonal peak. Apparently, ice cream is getting more popular. Um, why might razor burn correlate? Is that because ice cream causes razor burn? Okay, we have one yes. Clearly, you've never shaved. Yes, but does ice cream cause razor burn? So what causes razor burn in that scenario? Right, okay. So now we're getting somewhere with correlation and causation. So let's talk about causation. Uh, here's a little chart. Uh, you know, causation is one of these things where people have been arguing over the definition for many years. If we're going to say that uh, x causes y, what does that mean? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Okay, but you've just restated it. What does is, what is <laughs> if x then y mean? So y, y would happen immediately after. Happen immediately after. So something about time. Okay. And it also means that if x causes y, then y doesn't happen first. The thing that happens first is not the effect. But, um, you know, the things happen after things all the time. Not all of them are causes. What else is characteristic of a cause? What does influence mean? What does relation mean? 
it's a precondition or is something uh -huh. that it's a key precondition? It's necessary. So it's necessary. Well, well, something else might cause y as well. But we're on to something. Because z might also cause y. It's, it's, it's sort of the other way around. It's if we see x, then we're definitely going to see y. If we see y, then we may or may not see x. Right, so it's. But even if you don't definitely see y, it's still going to be a Yeah, cause you could, so you can have probabilistic causes. And in fact, that's what we're going to do. Uh, But we're, we're, on to, we're on to some key ideas here. What I'm going to show you is a mathematical formulation of the definition of cause in terms of probability. So, but there's a model. The first thing is that um, we're going to say there's some, thing in the, some things in the world. There's some relationships between them. And some of these things we can observe. And by observe, what I really mean in this context is turn into data. I can take a measurement. I can count it. I can ask whether the light is red or green. I can turn it into data. And it's some network of things, and we're not going to be able to see all of them. And uh, then we're looking for a particular type of relationship between x and y. Uh, in this case, I know I've been throwing all of these at you. Do, do, you, do you think that there is a cause between x and y here? Well, I got someone shaking their head. Why not? Because there's no pattern. Well, that's interesting. How about now? Is there a cause between x and y? Maybe. Seems more plausible. This, this is a correlation. It's not a cause. So this is not enough. So the pattern alone is not enough. That was that whole speech I just gave you about correlation. Right? The, the correlation is a pattern. This is a type of correlation. This is not cause. But, but it's necessary, because that's definitely not cause. This could be. So here we go. We're going to talk a little bit um, about the ways in which that type of pattern can occur. And really, so we haven't defined cause yet, but I've now I've got a little symbol for it, this little arrow. And, and what I'm talking about in this slide is the relationship between patterns and causes. And this is it. There are no other cases. So if I see that uh, searches for ice cream and searches for razor burn are correlated, which one of these patterns do you think applies? Why are they correlated? Another variable caused them? What's the other variable? Our weather. Right. The other thing to notice is this can go either way, right? So if I uh, but, but I can often rule that out. I can rule that out by my model of how the world works. So lead causes crime is plausible because I have this, this background about neurotoxicity. I have this theory. Crime causes lead seems unlikely, just from my background knowledge of the world. So the, you can consider these as alternate hypotheses. Right? If, you're, if you see a correlation and you're asking how does this correlation happen, this is your set of initial hypotheses. Now there may be different flavors of these, but you know you might speculate on different mechanisms, different ways in which x can cause y. But this is your starting set, and notice chances on there. That's always it's always an option. That's always an all hypothesis. I want you to burn this into your brain. All right, this this slide. If you get nothing else from this lecture, you get this slide. This will save you a tremendous amount of grief, and also this is really good for taking apart other people's arguments. Normally, what happens when people are talking about a cause and it's and it's bullshit is this case, but very often this case as well. 
that was the case we saw with the vaccination. Right? The vaccin there, so the, the editorial writer was claiming vaccination causes deaths. Nate Silver was claiming, no, it's this. The formal definition of cause, which is in your readings, uh, there's a mathematical theory of cause. And what the mathematical theory of cause says is in this network of relationships, you can establish cause only if you can do an experiment. So you have to try it two different ways. One is, uh, you know, sort of the natural state or the control condition. Another is you change one variable. Right, so, you know, does watering the plants get the pavement wet? Well, you try to water the plants. So, so naively, what you do is you water the plants and you see if the pavement gets wet. That fails. That's confirmation bias. You need to rule out the alternative hypothesis, such as the pavement gets wet randomly, that it rains, uh, the pavement's always wet, maybe it's a leaking pipe. So you have to compare it to something else. You have to compare, I watered the plants, I didn't water the plants. If you see a change in whether the pavement is wet, that is evidence that watering the plants is a cause. So you do an experiment. So that's the formal definition of cause. When you manipulate one variable, what happens is all of these variables that, are, that you follow the arrows, and all of the variables that you can reach by following arrows also change. That's the definition of cause in a formal sense. It has to do with the idea of manipulating the system and seeing what changes. Uh, so if I watch this crash into this and it pushes that, I can't easily distinguish between cause and coincidence in theory. Um, but if I get to try it two different ways, I'm going to try it this way. Nope, still there. Okay, I'm going to try it this way. Ah, okay. That's establishing cause. This is the, this is the, the idea behind an experiment. This is just a rephrasing of a very old idea. Unfortunately, this also means that if you can't do an experiment, you cannot establish cause. <coughs> Except in very specific circumstances where you have another variable that indicates the relationship and the, um, the reference goes into that. But by and large, you're looking for an experiment. Or if there's not an experiment that you can do, then you're looking for what's called a natural experiment, which is I have two cases that are the same in as many ways as possible, and this one watered the plants and this one didn't. And I think I can rule out all of the other ways that they might be different or all of the other things that might have been happening. But it, the, the, the basis of it is comparison. The, if, you, if you're going to establish cause, you have to compare with and without the thing that you're claiming is a cause. If you have no comparison, you have very weak justification for claiming a cause. So far, so good? Another way of talking about it is you have to have the alternative hypotheses that there's no cause. So here's a direct example of that. Um, this is a very interesting study. Facebook did this experiment with 250 million users because they wanted to know, does seeing a link in your newsfeed make you more likely to share that link? Seems like it should, right? Problem is, uh, homophily, if there's a link about a movie and I shared it, did I share it because one of my friends put it in my feed? Or did I share it because I was talking with my friends about it at lunch? Or they emailed it to me or they IM'd it to me? So without a comparison condition, there's no way to tell. So what they did is they randomized the users. And then for each link that got shared on Facebook, they said, oh, the users in this set are just never going to see the link. They're just not going to put it in the Facebook newsfeed. 
And so what that does is it removes this cause, right? They, they take the story out and they either let that story appear or they remove that story. And then this is the thing that they can observe. These are the things they can't observe. These are the things they can manipulate. And they look at the difference between the sharing behavior when that link was there and the sharing behavior when the link wasn't there. And you subtract the two and you get the influence of the sharing. So even though all this stuff is going on that they can't see, because they can manipulate something to, uh, to compare two conditions, they can still look at cause. It's actually a really interesting study, but um, unfortunately we're not going to talk about it. I know, I'm such a tease, right? Okay. The last thing we're going to do tonight is I'm going to ask you to use your newly informed inferential brains and help me solve a real data journalism problem. Actually, a, a guy I know in, in at the uh, New York Daily Post who's working on this. So, NYPD stop and frisk. How many people know what this is? All right, a couple. This is what this is. Uh, they, the police stop uh, randomly, they say, uh, half a million people on the street every year and uh, frisking for guns. And so here's some basic statistics. You know, you can see the ethnicity, they stop. This corresponds overall to the population of the city. The data is open. It's available right down to the block level. Now, there has recently been uh, an investigation by the Associated Press showed that in 2006 and subsequent years, the NYPD was cooperating with, uh, well, they had an intelligence unit that was liaising with the FBI, which is illegal because the, as I said, the CIA because the CIA can't spy on Americans, and they were doing surveillance of the Muslim community in New York City and neighboring states. So as you can imagine, this uh, upset a lot of people. It's, of course, a, a civil liberties issue. I wonder, this, this, may, this may read completely differently in, in China, but this is the sort of thing people get upset about in the US. Um, And so one of the th and so one of the things that um, my friend the data journalist did is he took the addresses of the mosques that were listed as under surveillance, and he located them on the map, and then he knew which time when the surveillance program had started, and then he took an area of let's say 100 meters around the mosque, each mosque, and he plotted the number of stops, and what he found is that it went up after the surveillance program started. So, what's the, let's start with the, the, the obvious thing. So wh what is it that, what's the obvious interpretation of why that number increased near the mosques after the surveillance program started? Right, so, Call that H1 uh, mosque surveillance. Make this bigger. Okay. Let's apply this method. Uh, what are the other reasons we might see that increase? Oh yeah, here we go. Why else might we see it? We need other hypotheses. Just by chance. Chance, yep. How could we tell if uh, it seems likely to be by chance? Okay. Remember, remember this? Yeah. 
So what, how could we apply this type of idea to checking whether that increases chance? Not random maps, but pick random points. Pick a bunch of other random points in the map, take 100 meter disks, see how many of them increased in the following weeks. If it's very common, then this means nothing. Good. Let's suppose we do that and we still see it's not common. You know, let's say only 5% of the random stops or the random points we pick show this increase. What other hypotheses could explain this? Last time I asked this question, we came up with eight. Okay. Good one. Police stations near mosque. What else? What's that? Yeah, so Muslims commit more crime, sure. So, but these are random stops and frisks. They're not. Uh, they're not. So, 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 so the stops aren't random. Yeah. yeah. Well. Okay. So what? What are actually we saying there? We're saying that they're stopping more near the mosques, but we know that that's the case already. So they must be targeting. Um, yeah, I think that's a variant of, of H one. What about, uh, yes, maybe there's just more people, population density. Now you're starting to think. Uh, that's H1. Um, maybe. It's actually a different question. Whether or not they're racist and whether or not they're stopping the mosques is a kind of a different question. Not Probably not one we can answer from data. Um, all right, population density. There's lots more sort of in that conceptual direction. The, the wealth of the area. Wealth of the area. Why is that? It's more run down. More run down. So poorer neighborhood has more stuff. Okay, so. But, the, but it's meant to be very arbitrary. It's meant to be arbitrary, yeah. It depends on the whole of the so we have the data. We can check. We can run correlations of the stop density versus uh, the uh, economic, you know, income of the neighborhood. Although um, honestly, like it's pretty random. Um, you, I can tell you from looking at this map that it doesn't correlate to income. Unfortunately, one way you can tell that is that the black areas, which are blue, uh, have about the same number of stops as the white areas, which are green. But that's probably good, right? And in fact, I think the police are being very careful not to discriminate racially here. But there's this whole, let's just, let's just put this all into the category of, of demographics. Well, in that example there, there's a, there's a main street. Ah. So, shops, you know, you're getting it, but they're facing the mosque. Right, so. H4, mosques on main streets. How do we check if what they're really stopping, what they're really doing is stopping more on main streets, not near the mosques? <coughs> What's that? Yeah, if we have traffic data, or I mean, maybe we just know because we live in New York which streets are the main streets. But then what we have to do is we have to check against main streets that aren't near mosques as a control. Okay, um, there's, uh, I'm sure we can get a good two or three others out of this. So similar to that last one, there's a subway station. Okay, so let's, let's add that, mosques on main streets or near subways. There's another whole category of, of thing that uh, we found last time. Think about, yeah, similar similar idea. Yeah, it's it has to do with the spatial division, but there's another access to this. Think about patterns of mo movement. Yes, this is a great one. Um, 
let's call it group size. So the theory here is something like if you have four people walking down the street, maybe that change together, maybe that changes the probability that they stopped. Or maybe the police will stop that whole group and only check one person, in which case people who walk together in groups are going to be checked less and vice versa. Or maybe they're more likely to stop large groups and check everyone because they're worried about gang activity. But definitely a factor that we could check and control for. Because anything which makes people within that 100 meters of the mosque different somehow than people outside, regardless of whether or not it has anything to do with the mosque, is a way in which we would observe what we see in our data. That's a hypothesis which is um, compatible with the data. Um, so I'm going to put one more just to, to sort of wrap this up here. So with that hypothesis, you don't have to decide whether the hypothesis is the group size increases your chance of interest or whether it decreases it. You don't have to decide whether you just go. Well, ultimately, you have to work out which direction the effect is if you're trying to explain. Because if, if you've discovered that group sizes are larger near the mosque and larger groups reduce your probability of getting frisked, that's actually, the data is actually incompatible with that. So the data would actually reject that hypothesis, which is good, right? You want to you wanna say, no, that's not it. Um, I'm, I'm going to do one more, which, which I'm going to call time of day. People are going to the mosque to pray at certain times of day. Maybe uh, that's exactly when the police are coming on shift. Maybe that's when they're awake after drinking their coffee. There's questions like that. Um, some other things we found last time, subways, shopping malls, you know, uh, control for shopping malls. Check against churches. And then there's one really subtle one, which uh, is related to this. What's that? Oh no, actually, I wasn't. I wasn't saying weather at all. I was. Uh, it's what I was talking. About. That's a good one, though. Um, but you'd have to plausibly explain why areas in your mosques have different weather. <laughs> But remember I talked about arbitrary parameters? And if you have if you get to pick the parameter, you can change the result. Because there you get to pick which decade you look at, and you can change whether it looks like you have global warming if you only look at that decade. Right. So redo the analysis changing that distance. Change if it's, you know, try it with five meters, ten meters, twenty meters, two hundred meters. And maybe you just hit, you know, maybe what, what you get is a Depending on distance, you get this graph. Um, say this is 100 here. Maybe you get this thing where there's like just this weird peak. Maybe it's an artifact of the data. Maybe, maybe it's something about the grid system they use. Right? So that doesn't look very convincing to me. But if you get something which is more like this, <coughs> That looks more convincing. That says if you you know do a very small distance, there's nobody in that radius, so you don't really get anything. But if you do a bunch of intermediate distances, then you see it, and then as the distance gets bigger, it gets closer and closer to the global average. So that looks like a convincing pattern to me. So that's another diagnostic that you could run. All right. Your assignments for those of you working assignment. So this will be the last assignment that is uh, so it's a lightning round. This is the last one that's due, that's due in three days. Uh, we're, we're making it through and then the, the next one which is on uh, security, because that's the last process on security, will be due um, after uh, New Year. This assignment you're going to take uh, this data on gun ownership versus number of homicides uh, per country. And um, I've given you a file which has cleaned it up a little bit, made it a little easier. You're going to analyze it. You're going to do a couple of plots, and you're going to tell me what you see. 
You're going to compare some different groups, OECD versus non-OECD, and I'm going to ask you to give me an interpretation of what the data shows. And then we're going to take the trickiest case, what you'll, uh, and you'll, you'll find that the U.S. is an outlier. We're going to remove the outlier, and then I'm going to ask you to tell me, is, the pattern, is there a pattern, is the pattern real? And you're going to do it by using, um, there we go, the, the Texas technique. It's, a, it's not called the Texas technique. It's actually called, um, oh, it's skipping pages. That's why it's not, not doing this. Uh, it's actually from a paper which is in your reading, so you should check that out if you want to understand what you're actually doing. Um, and it, it's called the lineup. You're going to do this. Uh, and of course, you can't um, look at the data while you're de debugging it, so there's some test data. Uh, so you're going to program in R. I'm going to give you the framework so that you don't have to learn how to do plots in R. Most of it is already filled out for you. You're just going to write the core algorithm that produces the uh, control data that takes the data and randomizes it. And we haven't talked about it, but what this is is it's something called a permutation test, which you can use for uh, a scatter plot. And now this looks pretty convincing, but let's say we're not sure and we want to say, is there a pattern here? What we do is we keep all of the x-axis values to the same but then we swap the y-axis values. So we, uh, going back to this, this table, what we do is we <coughs> swap around. You're going to plot um, homicide rate against uh, firearms per 100 people. You swap around the, uh, the firearms per 100 people column. You reassign it randomly, and then you plot it. And that's going to give you your control group. Because remember, the situation you're trying to differentiate against is random data. You know, is this a random pattern? The, the, the H0 is there's no relation. And if there's no relation between the variables, then if you swap them around, the pattern's going to look the same. So the question you're going to ask, have to ask answer is, when you remove the pattern, when you swap them around, do you still see the same pattern or not? Can you still figure out which one is the real data? And the reason I want you to do this is because, you know, you will, at some point, some of you, or maybe already have, taken a statistics course, which will go deep into the mathematics of statistical tests. I want to give you a fundamental tool and a way of thinking about it, which is, yes, statistical tests are great. But what I'm actually trying to do is I'm trying to understand what this looks like and whether my data looks different from this. And to do that, what you have to do is figure out how to generate the random case. And then you can use this technique. Does that make sense? And hopefully, um, aside from the correlation causation slide, which, as I say, should be etched upon your eyeballs at this point, um, the two other things I want you to remember from this whole class, I know we've been through a huge amount, uh, one, generate lots of hypotheses and compare them. And uh, the other one is use this technique. It's very, very general. You can do it with any type of visualization. You can do it with any type of data. All you have to figure out is what, how to generate things that would represent the random case so that you can compare your data to it. Okay, thank you.